this is Al Fritsch, uh, and we are at the Spir uh, Passionist Spirit and Earth Center uh, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And we're going to be speaking with Kyle Kramer and uh, talk about uh, the tremendous operations of this place, which as we will see in the background, is a converted farm barn, which has been used now as their office. I'm Kyle Kramer. I'm the executive director of the Passionist Earth and Spirit Center in Louisville, Kentucky. We're a ministry of the Passionist Religious Order, a Catholic order, and, uh, and we are an interfaith spirituality center. We are trying to help heal the relationship between human beings and our planet so that the planet can thrive and so that humanity as a whole can thrive. And we think that the way you do that is by starting within with contemplative practices like mindfulness meditation, centering prayer, and other things that help you get in touch with, uh, with your inner life. And we believe that in doing so, you'll begin to see the connections between yourself and other human beings, and so begin to work for just and equitable, inclusive communities, healthy communities. But you'll also begin to see the inseparableness of yourself and your own well-being from the planet as a whole. And you'll become what Thomas Berry says is um, you'll become earth literate. And so you'll become a, a responsible member and caretaker of, of the entire planetary community. And so we, with that conviction of spirituality, social justice, and what we call compassion, as well as environmental and uh, earth literacy issues, we offer a, a, a number of different programs as uh, in an educational capacity to invite people into their inner life, to invite people into the work of, of doing compassion in community and of caretaking for the earth. Kyle, this is a very uh, ener energetic and active center. Uh, now, you told me before you actually run 60-some programs a year? That's right. We have, we have three different what we call schools or program areas, meditation and spirituality, social justice and compassion, and um, a phrase that we borrowed from Thomas Berry, earth literacy. And across those three program areas, we, we offer anything from 10-week courses down to half-day workshops. And across those three schools, we'll do between 50 and 60 different programs uh, per year. We, we have several thousand students a year who come, come through our programs. This is all people from Jefferson County, or do they go beyond? Um, mainly from Jefferson County, but beyond. We have folks, some folks who have driven down uh, to Louisville from Cincinnati, okay. uh, over in the Kentuckiana region. Um, so uh, I'd say within, a, within an hour's drive or so. And come to find out, Father Al, we're actually the largest provider of uh, mindfulness meditation instruction in the entire central U.S. Really? So certainly in the region, and, and you have to go out to Boulder or the, or the coasts to find something comparable. So then you get people from all the, the states that are around here, even in the south? And well, we don't, but in terms of the numbers of students numbers. That, that come through our programs, there, there's no other organization that, that trains as many people as we do in, in mindfulness meditation. Do you give them a certificate at the end or something? No, we're, we're not affiliated with the university. Um, we, we do have some, I should say, we have some certificates of completion for particular programs, like a training program uh, for teachers and those in the school system to bring mindfulness into their work. We have some uh, certificates like that, but mainly folks are coming for their own enrichment. Now we're on the second floor of this, uh, was originally a barn, Yes. and uh, on the first floor right now is one of your programs that's going on? This, this, this building rarely has time to breathe. Uh, it's 100 and, let's see, 102 years old, was originally built uh, for the, the passionist religious community on whose property we sit as a, uh, as a cow shed, and uh, you know, housing chickens and plow horses and and it's been seen a couple different uh, iterations in its lifetime, and in the past yeah. 20 years, it's been a, um, uh, well, I should say 15 years or so, it's been renovated to serve as a, as a spirituality and, and instruction center. 
It was just an open loft when I saw it last. I did an environmental resource assessment here. Yep. And it was, uh, but now it's uh, beautifully located here, and you uh, on the campus, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you have plenty of parking places and and beautiful campus itself. We, now you use that campus for various reasons, don't you? We do. We have uh, 27 acres here uh, in in the middle of Louisville, uh, with. I should say, we, we rent, we're tenants of the, the Passionist religious community who, who owns the property, but, but we have a wonderful working relationship with the Passionists. Our, our founding uh, president, uh, Father Joe Mitchell, is a member of the Passionist community. And so we've, um, we've been able to work with the Passionists over, over these many years to, to steward this land. And we have a number of different projects that we can talk about to, uh, to um, um, bring this land back to health and to to use it for environmental and uh, educational programming. And you were saying some of it is used in gardening and some of it is wetland? And yes, um, so in the 27 acres we have uh, a, a probably 10, 12 acres of woods. We have uh, the balance in buildings, parking lots, and, and lawn and, and gardens. The garden program particularly has, has seen a couple different iterations over the years. We've run a, a community supported agriculture uh, garden. We've had we've hosted uh, two young women as market gardeners, and our our current and ongoing project is a partnership with Catholic Charities of Louisville and a refugee resettlement agency uh, services agency called New Hope, and we now host about a dozen and a half uh, refugees from Africa, mainly from the countries of Burundi and the Congo, and they uh, are, with support from Catholic Charities and from us, and from New Hope, they're they're feeding 150 people uh, through through their community gardening efforts, and and that's just in our first year with with a, on a fairly small scale. Now we've um, we've expanded those gardens, we've tilled them up, and and they're ready to plant for next year. Probably, oh, I'm I'm thinking we're going to increase our cultivated area by five or even tenfold and add, um, hopefully add uh, greenhouses for season extension. Is that on these 27 acres? That's right. All that, on the 27 That's right. So the, right. the ultimate hope is that I mean, beyond simply feeding their families, these, these refugee growers, most of whom were gardeners or farmers in their home countries, are, are going to get all the physiological and psychological and communal benefits of gardening, uh, but also become entrepreneurial. And so be feeding their families first and foremost, but be growing enough produce that they can also sell at market and, and perhaps make Do you furnish a, a, or a manager or a person that oversees them, or do they do it all on their own? Uh, there are several people who help this process work. I would say I'm, I'm the main point person for the Passionist property and for the Earth and Spirit Center relationship. Then Catholic Charities has has a, a farm manager or logistics person who uh, who who works most closely with with um, with the refugee growers because their their growing season back home looked different than ours and the crops that they grew uh, were likewise different. So ac helping them acclimate. But but interestingly enough. Um, they're now growing many of their native crops Is here. Right? And I, I had to learn names like Machicha and Inquare and all of these, these crops that I was not familiar with. And then I, I should also uh, mention that New Hope International um, provides an absolutely indispensable service for translation and, and transportation and really, really strong support of the refugee families. Uh, they deserve a YouTube uh, video themselves, think, don't they, in the middle I, of summer? I <laughs> think so. Yeah, well, we, we'll see what we can do. Well, good. Um, <laughs> we just had a harvest uh, potluck celebration at oh. the end of October. End of October. And we had the downstairs presentation space filled with uh, with tables and chairs. We, I think we had 70 people eating um, oh. the uh, the bounty of the season. Uh, both from the refugee community and, and from our from our regular student community. So come back then too. All right. Well, we'll be showing this, and of course, of your talk, we will be shooting the various sites when we go out and see it. Okay. And so you've got a also a wetlands that you've set up there too, haven't you? Yes, we worked for I think it was close to a year, 
to forge a partnership with the uh, Sheltoe Environmental Education uh, Coalition out of Moorhead, Kentucky, okay. and and predominantly the other partner was the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife Services, and so with with uh, funding from the Fish and Wildlife Service and and technical expertise and project supervision from the Sheltoe Coalition, uh, particularly Tom Biebighauser, who's a renowned wetlands ecologist and, mm -hmm. and builder of wetlands across yeah. North America. Um, we had uh, construction equipment in uh, late August and built two of the largest urban wetlands uh, in Louisville. To, Is that right? Yeah, to filter uh, rainwater that comes across the land right, right. to... Um, so a real working wetland. Absolutely. Yeah. And it wasn't it, a natural work. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that, Father Al, because yes, it's, na it's, it's, it's a working wetland and it's constructed with heavy equipment, but, but it's it also... Yes, it's the original site of Beargrass, the Beargrass Creek Channel, of the, the South Fork of Beargrass Creek, which had been rerouted back in the 30s, I believe, for flood control and some other reasons. But, but we were actually creating this wetland in the original channel. It, it wanted to be a wetland. Right. It always, right. It always well, in Kentucky it. law, we're not allowed to destroy wetlands right. anymore. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing is reconstructing exactly. what was partly a wetland probably in the past. Yes. And oh, wonderful. And we actually, we partnered with several local organizations yeah. in the construction and in the ongoing yeah. uh, programming. So for example, just across the, the campus is St. Agnes Catholic School. Mm -hmm. And so when, when this uh, wetland was being constructed, there were, imagine hordes of third, fourth, and fifth graders running around spreading straw for uh, uh, erosion control and walking on logs that had been pushed into the, the basin for the wetland. Uh, so that we have school kids involved on an ongoing basis. And then also down the road is Bellarmine University and their environmental studies majors come up as part of their lab experiences and they, they do the very detailed monitoring of soil acidity and, and alkalinity in the water and species. They, they've done baseline measurements, and so they're, they're basically going to help us understand, uh, as part of their own learning experience, how these wetlands evolve over time mm -hmm. and, and how they do their work. Wonderful. You're looking at a newly constructed wetland in the bottom land of the Passionist property here at the Earth and Spirit Center. This serves many purposes. It um, filters rainwater as it flows across the land and helps filter out any sort of toxins before that water reaches Beargrass Creek 100 yards away. It also attracts wildlife. It, um, we planted native species around the woodland or the wetland and it's a great place for turtles and frogs and other uh, aquatic species to flourish and, and perch on these these trees. So it's a, it's a way to bring diversity back into the ecosystem. We try as much as possible to water our gardens with rainwater that we capture from the south side of our barn roof. So there you can see the 400 gallon tank that captures that rainwater and, and we use that for irrigation. In addition to tending gardens, our refugee growers also keep beehives. We have two hives. This is their first year in operation and the refugee Growers were able to harvest about two and a half gallons of honey, and they have big plans for more hives in the future. This is our composting area where we take uh, garden waste and even paper towels from our bathrooms and turn it back into rich soil for our gardens. You're looking at the winter version of our herb and pollinator garden. We partnered with Kentucky Waterways Alliance and Pollinators for People to plant a number of species that attract butterflies and other pollinator insects to provide good habitat for them. Being an interfaith spirituality center, we try to uh, recognize um, symbols from various traditions. And this was a, a Boy Scout Eagle project a year ago. It, it's uh, traditionally the uh, entrance to a Shinto temple, but we use it to mark the entrance to our contemplative nature trail system in our 27 acres of woods and fields here. 
at the bottom of the hill you'll see a patch of green which is the new field we just cleared to expand our garden area for our refugee agriculture program so that they can grow food not only for themselves but for market. Our primary work here is educational and so one of the main ways we spread the word is with the really thousands of people who come through our door every year to take part in our various programs from school-aged children having a, a, a nature camp experience and yeah. learning about gardening and food prep mm -hmm. all the way through to folks committed to a 10-week uh, meditation course. Um, but we also were very active on, on the web. Uh, our website is earthandspiritcenter.org and we're active on social media. We also have a, an outreach program that we call the Mindfulness Mentors. And because we think the core of, of healthy communities and a healthy planet is healthy, uh, well-adjusted, um, interiorly centered human beings, we want to make that kind of instruction available very broadly and not just to the people who have the time and money and transportation resources to come have uh, experience classes here. So they, you go out to them? We do. We, we provide uh, absolutely free um, pro bono meditation instruction for at-risk groups such as uh, we, we partner with social service agencies like uh, Mary Hurst Alternative Academy and many others to work with um, single mothers who are trying to complete their, their GEDs, with uh, abused teenage girls, with um, people in addiction and recovery programs, uh, at-risk kids in inner city neighborhoods over in the West End. Uh, are you going, your personnel is going there, or well, well, we have materials we, that you give them? No, what we have done is we have trained a series of what we call mindfulness mentors. These are, these are students who have gone through our programming and um, have learned the practices of, of mindfulness. They themselves have a, have a personal commitment of at least, I believe, two years uh, to that practice. And so we, ha we have a training program to train them to go out as our ambassadors oh, okay. and and provide these usually four to eight week instructional experiences in these offsite locations, and we we source we provide materials um, by way of anything from yoga mats to binders and, and handouts and things like that. So it's it's a commitment of ours. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We have been looking at the Passion of Spirit and Earth Center, hearing the people watching their, the great progress that they are making in dealing with the people of Jefferson County, Kentucky, and also in the surrounding areas. And uh, it was such a great opportunity and experience to meet with them. And we hope that you watch this and enjoy the show and come and connect, connect with them in some fashion. This is Al Fritsch from Earth Healing. Thank you.